Good morning, Emmanuel Church. It is great to be here with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, my name is James Connolly. I am the youth and outreach pastor here at Emmanuel Church, and I welcome you. I also want to give a special welcome to those of us uh, that are tuning in via live stream. We are so happy that you're with us this morning, and we welcome you as well. We have a few things that we want to give you updates on and just remind you of that are coming up very soon. Uh, first and foremost is coming up on this coming Saturday, we have the No Regrets Men's Conference. Wow. Yes! Thank you! I love that enthusiasm. Um, and men, this is the last day for you to sign up, so do not miss out on this. Uh, the cost is $20, but if you've never been to this conference, the cost for you is nothing. It's free if you've never been. And so we want you to sign up, and where you sign up is at um, our Emanuel Church website under the Men's Ministry uh, tab. You can sign up right there and get uh, registered and taken care of for that. And it's not just for men, it's also it's for teenagers as well, so teenagers. Let me know if you want to sign up. We'd love for you to come on out for that. It truly is going to be an awesome, awesome day. Breakfast and snacks will be provided to men. You will not regret it. Uh. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're all awake now. Good. This is great. I also want to remind you also of the chili cook-off, which is going to be next Sunday evening. Uh. Woo! Now, we know who has won. I think it's been every year that it's in its existence. If I remember, right, the, the youths, those youths. So how many of you are ready to try to challenge their, their throne, to dethrone the youth? How many? I, I've only, I heard them more than I heard anybody else. So I hope you guys are really taking this seriously because I would love to see some amazing competition. Actually, we do have amazing competition every year. But come on out for that. If you haven't signed up for that event, please go sign up so that we can know that you're coming. And it's not just about chili. We're going to have all sorts of entertainment that evening that's going to be a lot of fun. So it'll be a great family-friendly event. So come on out for that. I also want to give you an update. We have an update from our team in Uruguay that is, uh, they've been there this past week on missions and we gave you an update saying that they had some trouble getting out there but since they've gotten there things have been going very very well they've just completed five days of vbs getting to minister to kids uh, through music through games through teaching through crafts it's been a, a blessing time ministering for the lord and now tonight they actually get to lead youth group and so far, they have seven kids that are committed to coming to that. And if you've ever done youth ministry, you know that seven is enough for it to be a challenge and crazy because kids are crazy and it's awesome. So be praying for them that God will use them mightily tonight as they get to minister to these teenagers. And also be praying because tomorrow evening they're fl uh, flying back and they'll be getting in Tuesday morning. So we want to be praying for all their travel that everything goes well in the process. I'm gonna, at this time, I'm going to invite uh, Pastor Dwayne to come join me up here. Because, uh, you know, Dwayne, I think something happened big the last two nights. I don't know. This, I don't know. It, it, was there something important there was, happening here? There was something happening here. This room looked a little bit different. It looked quite a bit different, actually, the last couple of nights. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, we had our sportsman's banquet here last uh, Friday, Friday and Saturday here. Uh, our 26th annual sportsman's banquet. So, See, you can tell by the pictures on the screen. That's what we did. It was really cool. We had, uh, we, this room was transformed uh, into a, a banquet room, and it was just a great night. A couple of things happened. First of all, I want to give a, a big thank you to everyone who had a hand in making this happen. I actually started to make a list, and my phone works with me. I actually started to make a list of people that were, not individuals, but things that people did to make this weekend happen. And you know what? I'm probably forgetting like a half a dozen when I make this list. But I'm just going to tell you some. Set up and tear down. There was building of displays in the foyer. There was caring for the parking lot, especially on Friday night during the snow that came and it made everything slick. And people were out there with ice and sand and taking care of that, parking cars. Cleaning. People were here early and here late cleaning it up before us. Running the sound, bringing desserts. Oh, my goodness. The desserts were amazing. And thank you all for making desserts, bringing desserts, buying desserts, whatever it was. Loved that, cutting desserts, prepping the food, uh, cooking, greeting people warmly when they came in, registration, um, just ser serving, uh, serving drinks in the, in the, when the people got their food or serving the, the food in the, in the lines, praying. Many people prayed and prayed and prayed for this event, loved that. 
taking time just to talk with people, uh, had those good conversations as God led them. Just lots of people involved. We call this an all-hands-on-deck event, and it was, and you guys all stepped up to that. I just want to say a big thank you for everybody that helped uh, participate to help this happen because it was a great, great time. Yeah, and and I think everybody owned that all-hands-on-deck mentality because there were so many times, especially last night, where we got to see uh, people just stepping in stepping in whenever there was a need. If there was need for extra servers or any of that, people were just stepping in like crazy and making things happen. And so it was really cool getting to see people just jump in head first and make sure that, and being willing to serve in that way. I'm getting a wave back there, so I'm, I'm, yeah, Mike. Oh, oh, you want to hear the jokes? Oh, oh, man, man. Go ahead. Do you want me to do mine? Go ahead. All right, so. I'm working with Dwayne seven months now, and as you know, uh, when you work with people and you work in a place that have a common fridge, you have to put your name on all your little lunches as you go in. That way no one steals your lunches. Well, I found a way more efficient way than just writing your name on it. I actually went and got a bunch of stickers printed with a buck on the stickers, and I just put that, I know that as long as that buck is on my lunch, Dwayne's going to miss it. Thank you, thank you. It actually went over way better last night. You're all half asleep and not appreciating the hunting jokes. I'm actually glad it didn't go over as well. Yeah, today. I know. They're just like, I don't get it. Uh, you asked for it, Mike. <laughs> all right, we could we could tell we we did we we told a lot of jokes uh, in the last couple of days. Um, some of them actually were good. Um, <laughs> those jokes were brought to you by Pepto Bismol, by the way. Hey, uh, you, we started talking about how this room was different uh, mm-hmm. last night and Friday night. So, James, you, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah. What do you, tell me a little bit about what the, how that looked. I mean, oh, you can see some pictures, but what do you tell I mean, there was tables everywhere. You can see on the, the picture right now on the screen. There was tables all throughout the room. It truly really looked like a banquet, which it's called one, so we did a good job making it look like one. Wow. And people everywhere fellowshipping, eating together, breaking bread. It was really, really an awesome atmosphere. It was. We had it was set up for 250 people yeah. uh, at chairs, and it was comfortable. It worked out really well. So that was just really cool. It was the first event we've done in this newly renovated sanctuary yeah. in this way, uh, and it was really cool for people to walk in, see that, uh, and then some of actually were even asking, "Well, how do you hold church here?" Really said, "Well, we take the tables down. Yeah, uh, we don't serve <laughs> Steve said we don't serve food every Sunday, <laughs> not in this sanctuary, anyways." <laughs> well, and if you look around the room like. It, 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 everything's fine. It still looks like a sanctuary today, and yeah. the carpet is still there and in one piece, no stains. Worked so out. we made out okay. Worked out well. We replaced the carpet, <laughs> but no, we, we I'm just kidding. We no, made we out did. okay. Everything worked well, and it, it was a great multi-use room getting to be creative, and God moved in a really powerful way. He really did, and that was the main part of the whole thing was the people. Uh, some pictures here of some of the, the people. I took some snapshot here from the fa- from the front of the room that uh, on Friday night. Um, and this is exactly what we hope to accomplish with, with uh, the Sportsman's Banquet, and that is the church being on mission, mm-hmm. you being on mission in your area of influence. And we saw that. People inviting their friends, inviting their coworkers uh, to come out. People who had never stepped foot in a church actually came last night. That was really exciting. Uh, so that was a beautiful time for that, to see the church be the church. Uh, in in, a, in a, this kind of a format, I actually have some numbers I'd like to to run by you just because it is cool what God does. He's a numbers guy. <laughs> I'm a numbers guy. Yeah. That is true. So last night, the last two nights, great presentation, lots of good information, but also the gospel was presented very clearly. Yeah. And we asked people at the end of that we have a, res- a response card for that and if we say if you accepted christ for the very first time in your life tonight this was that time when you actually made that commitment would you please check that box seven people check that box amen. that is cool amen. amen in addition to that we also asked people you know there was a challenge that if if you're feel like you're getting you've gotten off track with god you feel like you need to get back on track with him we have a, a, a place here to check and respond, and we had a time of prayer for that too. Of hey, I want to rededicate my life to Christ t- today. I was going to today's a, a new spot for me, and that was 65 people to check that box. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Praise the Lord. Way God works. 
We had another half a dozen people or so that said, hey, I want more information about church. I just want to talk to somebody, that kind of thing. We have plans to reach out to all those people, and we're very excited about that. Yeah, and I think one of the cool things that is is kind of an encouragement in us is when we think about evangelism, one of the things that discourages us so much is getting rejected or it, just somebody not really responding in a well way. And look, we had 500 people here in the building the last two nights, and we had 72 that had these impacting wow moments. And so That's 72 cool. out of 500, which is actually amazing, but it gives you this ratio of, you know, it takes a lot of people ministering, giving opportunities before finally someone's going to go, you know what? I need Jesus. Yes. And so don't get discouraged and don't give up from ministering to people because it may not be you leading them there, but you're getting to be that person that's getting them a little bit closer to finally getting to that place of making that choice. You bet. So thank you so much for being part of that, for helping make it happen, but also for being those ones who are inviting your friends and so forth. So, you know, I'd just like to take a moment now and just pray over this. I want to thank God for what he did this weekend and just lead us into our, uh, our time as we continue this morning together. Father God, you get all the glory. Lord, it was awesome to see you moving amongst us in the last couple evenings. Lord, it happened in the public arena, so to speak, in the conversation and in the gospel presentation and the responses. But Lord, it, it happened all throughout this building in a number of little conversations that took place. And it was just so beautiful to watch. God, thank you for your church that you've established and you are pushing forward. Lord, thank you for your, the people being obedient and willing to be on mission in their area of influence. Lord, you deserve all the praise. We want to give you all the praise and glory for that today. And Lord, as we continue to gather in this setting today, as part of your church, we gather, Lord, today to worship you, to exalt your name on high. So Lord, may may everything that comes from us today, may our thoughts, may our emotions, may our inmost depth, those feelings that are deep down inside, Lord, may all of it unite around you today. May you be glorified and praised in all aspects of our service and all we do. We commit this to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I invite you to stand with us as we worship together. Whether you're here in person or whether you're online, we just want to welcome you and we want to worship the living God this morning. Psalm 29 says, Ascribe to the Lord. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name and worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Let's worship Him together as a church. He's coming on the cloud.
Ascribe to the Lord. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. This past week, we've been focusing on the reawakening of the Church of Christ. And we are that church this morning. We are gathered together to worship the Lord, to be in his presence, to exalt him as King of kings and Lord of lords. So this morning, we're, we've created some space to do that publicly, to do that as a church family. You'll see here in the, in the front, there's a, a microphone set up. And I just want to encourage you as the Spirit leads, come before Him and praise the name of Jesus. You can do that in prayer. You can read scripture. But let's point it back to the Lord Jesus Christ to exalt Him for who He is. And I just want to encourage you, if you come forward, keep it short so that we leave lots of room for others to worship the Lord. So let's come, let's be a people who praise the name of Jesus. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth are yours. Yours is the kingdom, O oh Lord. Yours is the church, O oh Lord. And you are exalted above heaven over all. Jesus, you are the Lion and the Lamb, Lion of Judah, who triumphed over the enemy, the death, the devil, the sin. And you are the Lamb, you are our sacrifice, you are our atonement. We worship you and we praise you.
Sabad alegres a Dios, habitantes de toda la tierra, servid a Jehová con alegría, venid ante su presencia con regocijo, reconocer que Jehová es Dios, Él nos hizo, y no nosotros a nosotros mismos, pueblos suyos somos y ovejas de su prado. Entrad por sus puertas con acción de gracias, por sus atrios con alabanza, alabadle, bendecid su nombre. Porque Jehová es bueno para siempre su misericordia y su verdad por todas las generaciones. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness, coming to the presence, His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is our God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Then God said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still, small voice. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, we praise you, honor you, Lord. Thank you.
Lord, you've shown up in powerful ways in this place these last two nights. And you have shown up this morning. Lord, we are thankful for you. And Lord, right now we come to you with surrendered hearts, asking for you to move. For we don't want to leave here the same as we came in. We don't want to leave here and miss out on what you have for us. And so Jesus, as we come into your word this morning, pierce our hearts. Reveal to us things in our hearts that need not be there. Lord, speak to us. May healing occur. May work be done. If there's anything standing in the way right now of us and you, get rid of it. May it be gone forever. Jesus, we want you to move. And we come to you, Lord. Surrendered hearts. Laying our troubles, laying our burdens at your feet. And saying, Jesus, have your way. And the rest of this time in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Whew, that was awesome. <laughs> really, really awesome to worship the Lord together with you. Hey, uh, before we dismiss the kids, I wanted to just put this out here for everybody for our church that starting three weeks from today is our annual missions week. Why do we do a missions week? Because the glory of God to be known all across the world. We want, we want, the, we want all the peoples of the world to know about Christ and to know that there's salvation, know that there's hope, know, know that there is eternal life. And so uh, starting on February 20th, we're going to have two international workers with us that week. Why do we call them international workers? Code word for what word? Missionaries. But we don't want to use the word missionary associated with them because uh, it gets them to places where it's not welcome to be a missionary. So it's kind of letting you in on some of our language there. And uh, one of them is going to be Daniel Greenfield, who serves in Uruguay. And if you have been around our church at all, you know Uruguay is one of our partner locations. Uh, we, we have Bruce and Stephanie Beers from our church who serve down there. Actually, a team from our church is there right now. As you heard an update on this morning as we began our service, they're going to be coming back uh, with us in the next two days. And we'll see them next Sunday, Trisha and Anna and Colin. And so... Uh, Daniel service there, and then also an international worker from a creative access country in the Middle East. I'm not even going to name him because we're on live stream right now and it would damage his ministry. So uh, a schedule will be coming out this next week on our hub newsletter. That's on email. So if you don't get our hub newsletter, if you're not part of our email communications, make sure you get uh, contact the office this week and, and get that. It'll also be in the bulletin the next couple of weeks. Uh, leading up to our missions conference. So we're excited about that, and uh, it'll be stuff for kids, youth, adults, everybody. There'll be stuff going on that whole week. All right, now, kids who are age five up through fifth grade, you guys can head to your classes and follow in the back. Alyssa, you can wave your hand. Oh, she's already gone. Okay, follow out the back. So, uh, and you all can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 is where we're going to be today, and we're on the fourth week out of six in our 40 days of prayer. We've been doing this journey here since the beginning of January, and this week's theme has been on reawakening to the church of Christ, that, that God would give us a new, fresh vision, a new, fresh understanding and appreciation of the church that Christ has established and we are part of that church. It's, it's people of all time, of all over the world, who have placed their trust in Christ, turned from their sin, turned from the world, and, and placed their faith in Christ as their Savior. So let me ask you a question as we talk about the church. It's kind of introductory here. If you tore our building down right here that we're meeting in, would we still be the church? Because the church is not a building. If you took us uh, all together this morning and somehow we got to all get plane tickets together and fill up like a 747, you know, jumbo jet and fly to Cambodia this morning and, well, I guess there it's evening. But if we, if we, got, we went over there and joined up with the, the believers in Cambodia, would we still be the church? Yes, because it's not limited to a place, right? And if we were somehow to make a time machine 
and go forward like 500 years, would we still be the church? Hopefully we'll be in heaven then at that time. Maybe Jesus will have come back. We surely will all have died by that time. Uh, if we took a time machine back a thousand years, would we still be the church? Yes, because it's not limited by time. The key factor is if we have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, if we are saved, if we're part of the redeemed people that he has purchased for himself. Well, about two years into Jesus' three-year ministry, he took his disciples on a retreat. And he took them to a place that was a little bit, a little bit interesting. Uh, it was about 150 miles north of Jerusalem. We're going to go ahead and put a map on the screen here. Uh, you can't even see Jerusalem in this picture. It's actually further south than the picture, but there's the Sea of, of uh, Galilee, uh, and, and then you've got uh, all the way up to the very north, you've got where that red arrow is, you've got Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was uh, at that time located outside of Israel's territory, but during Jesus' day, um, yes, so during Jesus' day it was outside of the territory, but if you go back into where Joshua, who had conquered the land, that was totally within uh, the land of Israel. And King David and King Solomon, they had expanded the empire uh, again after you know, lots of wars and territory and all that stuff. So this, is, should, this should be inside of Israel's territory, but it's not currently. It was had been invaded by the Greeks and the Romans and uh, all kinds of other neighboring uh, tribes before that. So uh, lots of war happening in this area, but there was a special location that Jesus took his disciples to. But this place had a reputation for being kind of like the Las Vegas of Israel. Why was it called the Las Vegas of Israel? Well, here you can see uh, modern day ruins of, of that area. And there's caves that were uh, built or carved out into these huge rock formations in the area of Caesarea Philippi. And there were temples, one temple to Zeus, one temple to Caesar Augustus, and then a temple to a god named Pan. And this picture, and, th and this one right now, uh, this is the grotto of the Temple of Pan. It's kind of like the gathering place where they would come, and you know, they would worship the god of Pan there. And the god of Pan was half human, half goat. <laughs> you know, it's kind of an interesting creature. You can look up Google uh, you know, images of this, and it's really like, like half, like the legs are goat, and the upper part is man, but with a goat-like beard. Uh, kind of strange, had played a little flute, went around in the woods and like, you know, did things there. Um, but the way they would worship the God of Pan, who they, they saw as a God of fertility, for herds, for humans, um, you know, God who would bring blessing to them, they would want to appease this God. So they would get goat sacrifices and they would bring the goats and, and then they would do things involving sexual immorality and prostitutes and promiscuity. I won't fill in all the details, we'll keep it G-rated. But all kinds of sick and twisted things would happen at this place as they came to bring their sacrifices. In fact, they would also throw goats into the river after they sacrificed them, and then these goats and dead, dead bodies of things would be floating down. And actually, that's the way they punished people in that place too, is they threw criminals after they killed them into this river, and they would flow down from the springs out of this, this cave, and, and it would flow down, it was filled with blood, and it was just a, an awful place. We'll go forward one more, one more place there. You see this drawing? This shows you kind of how this rock uh, face, what it would have looked like in Jesus' day. On the far left side is the temple to Caesar Augustus. Uh, the grotto of Tupan is right next to that. Then the other structure in the middle is the temple to Zeus. Then on the, the far right is the temple to the dancing goats. <laughs> I mean, you can look all this stuff up. It's, it's for real. This actually happened right there. And Jesus picks this for his place to take the disciples this one day. And we're going to read about in Matthew 16. The Las Vegas of their day. Whole lot of other stuff going on there, fill in the blanks. What if, what if our elders at our church decided we were going to do a retreat to Las Vegas? What would you all think? A little sketchy? A little sketch? Um, you know, like what's going on? Why are they doing that? Jesus had a point. He was going to make an emphatic statement about the church. And so get this picture in your head. They're, they're right up at these, these temples. They're viewing all that's going on there with crowds of people. And then the interaction that is recorded here takes place. Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? 
referring to himself. That was a, a name, a title he, he had. And they replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. They're all confused. Those the people are. Jesus says, but what about you? Asking his 12 disciples, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was revealed to you, not by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. It was not yet time for that to be known. There's so much to say out of this passage. In fact, uh, volumes and volumes of books have been written about this passage. Uh, centuries of debate have happened about this passage. And I won't try to solve all of that today. We will touch on it. But uh, all I have to say, there's a key verse, verse 18, that we're going to focus in on. All the uh, other part before that and the parts afterwards, I'm, gonna, I'm going to touch on. But there's only so much time, and y'all don't want to stay here till like Tuesday. So we'll, we'll, we'll focus in as best we can on this. Jesus is standing in this crowd you can just, just get this, this picture of people coming, bringing their goat sacrifices. Over in the temple, the dancing goat literally danced with the goats um, <laughs> over there. And, and all this is going on, music and, and stuff and tents are going on all around there. Uh, and it's, it's like, why would you bring us here to this spot, Jesus? Like, you're, you're, this, you're this holy man. It's, it, it, why are we here? And they've got to be scratching their heads. And the irony is just, dripping in the situation. All these people are coming to worship. They're coming to seek blessing and seek favor of gods that aren't even gods. <laughs> they're deceptions. They're, they're empowered by Satan and the, their lies right from the pit of hell and they're all happening right around. And here's Jesus, the true God, the living God right there in front of them. And the disciples have a clue about that, but Thousands and thousands of people coming around have no idea who he is. <laughs> if they only knew, <laughs> they'd put their goats down and they'd come and talk to Jesus. And so he's talking to his disciples and he says, who do people say that I am? And people around are oblivious to what's happening. Probably most of them have no idea who Jesus is. The disciples answer the best they could because they had been in Israel for the majority of their time of the last couple of years. And so they're answering from what they're hearing people in Israel say, well, he wasn't well received in Israel for the most part, they rejected and, and people misunderstanding. So they say things like, well, some say you're John the Baptist, like kind of like reincarnated you're, or you're one of the prophets or something like that. They know that you're powerful. It's a great question Jesus asks. Who do people say that I am? Ask the question of yourself from the conversations you've had with people. Who do people say that Jesus is? I mean, some people have no idea. I, I don't even really know, to be honest. I've heard his name, but I don't, some places in the world, they've never even heard his name. Other people will say, well, he was a good moral teacher. I know that he said some really good things and I think it's in the Bible somewhere and they've never read it before. He's a good moral teacher. Or, or he was a prophet, right? Was he a prophet and he said things from God? And, or he showed us the example of love and he was very loving. And None of those are untrue, but they're far short of who he is. There's confusion about who Jesus is. Then he asks the payday question. He set them up as they're talking about who Jesus, what people say Jesus is. Who do you say that I am? Ask that question of yourself right here. Let your heart answer, who do you say that Jesus is? What's your conviction? What's your belief? What kind of relationship do you have with him? Who is Jesus? And the answer to that question 
is the dividing line in the sand. Depending on how you answer it, you're going to be on that side with people who don't understand or who reject him or those who understand him and bow the knee to him and receive him. Peter steps up. All the 12 disciples were asked the question, but Peter, Peter often speaks before he thinks, doesn't he? Lots of stories of that in, in the scripture. He uh, often is stubborn or slow to pick something up. Uh, you can see that not only before this moment, but also as into the early church. There's a lot Peter got wrong. But in this moment, he hit a grand slam. I mean, he stepped up to the plate. He was ready for the pitch. And he swung, boom, and knocked it out of the park. You couldn't have a better answer than what Peter gave. And as he gives this answer, this is what's known as Peter's confession. Not, not, don't go to the, the mind of, of like confessing of sin. Confession of, of faith. Profession of faith is the idea. You can look this up. This is actually theologically known as Peter's confession right here. This is the dividing line in the sand. Who do you say that I am? Jesus was eliciting this response from them, forcing them to, to make a point of decision. And Peter steps up and he says this. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ. That's the, the Greek word for the Messiah, the anointed one. And this has a lot of history for Israelites because God had been revealing in the scriptures for hundreds of years that there would be a Messiah who would come, an anointed one who would come, a savior, a king who would come and set God's kingdom up on earth, who would be the one who would bring God's salvation. But if you read the scriptures and the prophecies, it's not just a human kind of king. This is one that's going to be way greater than David. David's going to call this one Lord. And so it kind of refers to almost this idea that he's God. And then in Daniel chapter 9, it talks about him coming on the clouds of heaven. And so this is definitely not a human type of figure. This is one who's going to reign forever and ever. So he's eternal. And so they have this idea that the Messiah is, is actually, it's an expression of God on earth. And so, so Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, again, don't picture this idea of son being an offspring of God as if he's created of God or, or God had relations with someone and then Jesus was born. That's not the idea. That's a misunderstanding. Jesus called himself earlier the son of man, right in the same passage. That means he's the representative of mankind on earth. He's also the representative of God on earth, the expression of God on earth. Jesus, you are the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. You are God himself on earth. <laughs> I mean, succinct, but Peter nailed it. This is exactly who Jesus is. It's exactly what all the scriptures teach of who he is. And Peter stepped up and spoke on behalf of all the other disciples and gives the right answer gives this confession and you, and mind you it's not just that peter's pulling this out of a out of a hat somewhere he's been walking with jesus for over two years he's heard all that jesus has said he's watched jesus live he's seen him react in, in hard situations he's seen him react to criticism he's seen jesus heal people he's seen jesus stop the a storm in the sea just by speaking to it <laughs> he's seen jesus be able to multiply bread and fish just by pulling it apart and it just keeps going and going peter saw Jesus was God. He saw what he could do. And, and so Peter is, is saying, you're the, you're the one that has been sent. You're our savior. And Jesus says, Peter, you're blessed by saying this. You're, you're blessed that you know this. This wasn't just something you came up with. This was revealed to you by my father in heaven. He showed you this. Because Jesus has been, has been careful not to be super overt about this because if so, his death would have come a lot earlier. People who didn't believe his claim, they would have put him to death for blasphemy long before that. So this is why Jesus told him at the end, hey, guys, don't, we just had this conversation, but can you not say that too much yet? <laughs> it wasn't yet time. Peter knew it, spoke it, and there it was. And Jesus doesn't say to him, oh, Peter, whoa, whoa, no, you got that wrong. Yeah, 
I'm really not that one. I'm really not God. I'm really not the Messiah. No, he says, you're blessed. You see this. It was revealed to you by your father in heaven. And guess what? Now, Peter, I have a statement to say to you. And this statement that he made was, has echoed through the centuries, is now still reverberating with a roar through our world today. What, what Jesus says to Peter, and I tell you that you are Peter. He gives him a new name right there. We'll talk about that in a second. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That statement is still in effect today. I will build my church. All right, let's get into this. So Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter. Anyone know what the name Peter means? Rock. It's in, in the Greek, the name Petras, which is a rock. And it, it actually means kind of like a, anything from the size of a, a pebble or a skipping rock to something bigger, uh, something bigger you couldn't even lift up or throw, but kind of a chunk of a rock of some kind. That's the name, the word Petras. Up until this time, what has he been known by? What is his given name? Simon. And you've probably heard him called Simon. You've probably heard him called Simon Peter. You've probably heard him called just Peter. But this moment right here is the first time he's ever known as Peter. Any variation of, of, of that name. He was Simon before this. Now he's, now he's Peter or Simon Peter. Jesus says to him, based upon what he just confessed out of his mouth of who Jesus was, he says, Peter, you're a rock <laughs> because you said that. I'm giving you that name. And then what he says next is one that has caused a whole lot of confusion and discussion throughout the centuries. He says, and upon this rock, I will build my church. What Catholics and Eastern Orthodox interpret this to say is that Jesus is saying, Peter, you're the rock and upon you, I'm going to build my church. You as an individual, I'm going to build my church. And from that, then they extrapolate into a, a lot of uh, steps over here to say that, well, this means that Peter, as he's given the keys to the kingdom uh, on down there, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, that you have a special authority upon you to start the church and that I'm going to work through you in the working of the church. And then they say that authority to Peter is handed down to the next person who would take over that authority and then the next person. And that's where you get popes and bishops and, and all those kinds of things throughout the centuries. That's a huge leap from this passage. And we reject that interpretation. We do not see that as, as the truth. Um, so uh, that's not where we're going with this. But you still have the question, what does this mean? What, what is Jesus saying? Peter, you're the rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church. A couple of other interpretations could be there. One is that you could say, well, Jesus is saying, well, Peter, you're a rock. You, you got that down, and, and you're solid. But, but your name being rock is, uh, is a rock that's kind of a smaller rock. When he says, but upon this rock, I will build my church, that's the word Petra. It's different from Petros. Petra is a big rock. It's, a, it's like a foundation kind of rock. So upon this rock, I will build my church. Is he saying that that's me? Uh, Peter, you're a rock and that's great. But upon this rock, me, I will build my church. Or is he saying, it's, it's Peter, you're a rock and this confession that you made of this truth upon this rock, I will build my church. That it's the confession. And, and I don't know, there's a lot of debate about all that. I guess my view might be more of a combination and that that's been proposed too. Yeah, it's Peter. He's, he's, he's smaller. He's like a chip off the block, right? He, he gets it. And he, as he's saying this truth, it, it's kind of that the truth is built upon people and this confession that has been made of Christ. And upon people like that, upon that confession of the truth that we hold, he's gonna build his church. Because later on, he does talk about the keys of the kingdom that he's going to give so that we can have the effectiveness of supernatural power in this world. However you look at that, let me take you into a little bit more of the irony of that. Here he's standing there, he's talking to Peter, he gives him the name Rock. And he says, upon this rock, I'm gonna build my church. What's right in front of them? 
an enormous rock cliff that's sticking up out of the ground. And there's temples built into that. And these temples are building their foundations upon a rock, a gigantic rock. They're actually physically sitting upon these things. And Jesus is saying, not like that. That's not the foundation I'm going to build my church on. Peter, you are a rock. And upon this rock, this confession you've made, and, and you as, as a follower who, who stepped up and he said this, upon this, and the truth about me as Christ, I will build my church. It's not going to be about a place. It's not going to be about a temple. It's not going to be about something that you carve out on a rock, literally. It's going to be about, about the truth of who I am and people who carry this. I'm going to build my church. And so he says to Peter, you're the rock. And upon this rock, these next five words are still changing the landscape of history today. I will build my church. I'm going to look at each of those five words and the significance of what this means. Because Jesus is defining all of human history with this. I, Jesus speaking of himself, I will build my church. Who builds the church, folks? Come on, a little more conviction. Who builds the church? Jesus. Does he call us into serving with him? Each and every one of us, we're the body of Christ. We have different functions. We have different gifts. And, and we are to be active in joining him on his mission of building the church. But let's never get confused that somehow it's all up to us and that we have to go and build the church for him. He will build the church and he'll happen to use us. Do you see the difference? In John 15, verse 5, Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. You guys are the branches. If anyone remains in me, abides in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Christ, we're, we're never going to build the church. We can't have any grandiose plans and, and all these great commitments and, and, and all this self-effort. It'll never get us anywhere. The only way you're going to do anything significant, the only way I'm going to do anything significant in the kingdom of God is if Christ is doing it in us and through us. We build with Christ, but never for Christ. He says, I will build my church. The next word is will. This is a statement of certainty. It is going to happen. There's nothing that can stop him. There's no government that can stop him. There's no disease that can stop him. Satan can't stop him. The world, no person can stop him. I will build my church. Even if the odds are stacked against me, even if the world looks like it'll never happen, I will do it. And when God makes a promise, he always follows through. I will build my church. One of the things I love is to think about how there, our world has so many things that are opposing uh, Christianity right now. In fact, there's places where it's illegal. They're trying to stamp out Christianity. And yet it's growing faster in those places than it is anywhere else in the world. Uh, I mean, to think of like North Korea. They want, they want to stomp out all mentions of the name of Jesus or anyone who would ever follow Jesus. And yet it's one of the fastest growing church networks <laughs> that exists on the planet. North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan. Jesus is building his church today. It's going forward. It's on all six inhabited continents on the earth. It's in every nation, not to every people group yet, but it's, it's growing and expanding and it, it will one day reach everyone before Jesus comes back. Every people group will have the opportunity to hear and know and respond the name of Jesus. He will do it. John Piper described this as an air of triumphant authority in his voice. Do you hear it? <laughs> I will build. Jesus is the builder. It's one of the metaphors that we see in scripture of the church that we are a building. We are, we are a group of living stones, the scripture says, and Christ is the cornerstone. He's the foundation of this. 
and we become this dwelling place of God as we are built together. There's lots of metaphors of the church in scripture. Jesus is the shepherd and we're the flock. God our father is the father and we are his family. Christ is our brother. We are the bride being beautifully prepared for a groom and that groom is Jesus. He's coming back for us one day. This is the metaphor that we are a building. Not with bricks and mortar and drywall and electricity. We are the building of Christ. He's building us. And, and as you think about it, Jesus is the one who is the designer. He's like the architect and the, the one who dreamed this whole thing up. Then he steps in, he rolls up his sleeves, and he says, well, I'll be the foreman of, of this, and I'm, I'm going to make sure this gets built, and I'm going I'm to be the head of the church that makes this happen. But then not only that, but he's, he's down in the trenches with us. Didn't he come to our world, and, and, and didn't he give up his life for us? He's the laborer who's, who's getting this done for us, and, and, and in us, and through us. And Oh yeah, by the way, he's also the building materials. He's the cornerstone. <laughs> Everything about it, Jesus It's the one making it happen. I will build. Fourth word, my. My church. Whose church is the church? Jesus's. It's Jesus's. He purchased us with his own blood. We we are his. We are his people. Does the church ever belong to Like the people who wrote the checks to make a church building get built? No. Does the church ever belong to the people who actually, with their hands, built a church building? No. Does the church ever belong to a pastor? Please, no, because I don't want that responsibility. (laughs) Does the church ever belong to a denomination? Does the church ever belong to a country? This country has God more than this country. Please, no. Does it belong to an ethnicity or a race? No. Jesus says, I will build my church. And when we look at the end, we see the picture of around the throne of God. It's all the peoples of the world bowing before him. Not before any one person or, or another human being. Not even before angels. It's before Jesus. People from every tribe, tongue, and language bowing before Jesus. Because he will build his church. Which brings us to the last word of these five words. I will build my church. This is the first occurrence of this word in all the New Testament. I looked it up. I wanted to see, is it it anywhere else even in the Gospels? Actually, it's the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have the story of Jesus, have, have his ministry. It's the first place it comes up, Matthew 16. He's introducing a new term. a a new word that then would characterize who are the people of God that that then he has purchased with his blood, that he's redeemed for himself, that have stepped across that dividing line, that profess their faith in him as their savior. We are now called the church. This word would be picked up by all the apostles and and as they did, as they went through the book of Acts, uh, it records the story of all the things that they did. You see the word church getting used a lot there. And then uh, through the writings of Paul and the writings of Peter and the writings of John, all the different letters, you see the word church used a ton. Jesus is the one who grabbed this word and defined what it means. In Greek history, there was uh, a a term, uh, this is a Greek word, ekklesia, that was used for an assembly of people. Ek means called, or means out of. Klesia is the word from kaleo in Greek, which means to call. So we're called out of. And in, in the Greek context, it was a, hey, hey, we're calling you out to this assembly. We want you to gather. And that was used some, the word kind of died off a little bit. Jesus picks up on that word. He goes, I'm going to redefine that word and make it about my people. The ecclesia, the called out ones. You and I have been called out from our former life. We've been called out from our sin and from ourself. We've been called out of the world to be separate, to be distinct. In fact, Peter, who's right here in this conversation, decades later, as he's writing the book of 1 Peter in chapter 2, he says that we are a unique people. That God has has called us out. We are a a holy nation, a royal priesthood belonging to God that we may declare the praises of the one who's called us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the light. 
he's describing what Jesus is saying right here. That's the definition of the church. We've been called out to be these people. Jesus is introducing this term, I will build my church, my people, my called out ones, the assembly of all time, all places, all around the world of people who trust me and who follow me. And you know, when Jesus came to his disciples, you saw how he went to, you know, to the, the waterside and there was Peter and John, they were out fishing and he said to them, come follow me. What he was doing right there was ecclesia. He was calling them out. And if you're a follower of Jesus at some point in your life, think back right now when that was. When did Jesus come to you and say, hey, come follow me. Believe in me. Trust in me. Give your life to me. I'll make you a fisher of men. When did he do that for you? And if he's done that, you are part of the ecclesia, the called out ones, this gathering of people that are his. That's who we are. Jesus is building us. And here we are 2,000 years later. And the church still stands. The church is still advancing. The church has not been stopped The gates of Hades have not prevailed against the church, nor will they ever. Where'd that phrase come from? The gates of Hades? Well, something I left out earlier when I was telling you about this view at Caesarea Philippi, as they're they're there at this huge rock cliff that's just jutting up out of the ground as they're seeing all these people there coming to worship. There's these different temples. Inside of the cave where you had the temple to pan. There were 72 natural springs of water that were gushing up out of the rock from all of the winter snow and rains and everything, especially in the springtime, it was just gushing with water. The the water table was overflowing, coming out of the ground. And it was pouring down out of the cave and it was rushing down. In fact, there were cascades of waterfalls where the water would come. And, and as I mentioned before, there was like mist. And it was kind of an eerie place where, where the, uh, the water was coming up from, or the, the mist was coming from these, these uh, waterfalls. And this, this, uh, these springs were so deep, you couldn't see the bottom. You, you could see this giant pool of water just gushing up with water, but you didn't know how far it went down. Before the Greeks and the Romans ever got there, you had the Canaanites, the God of Baal. Uh, if you hear this in the Old Testament, uh, they worshiped the God of Baal right there. And so all their theology, their view of God, got then layered in by the, the Greeks when they came and conquered it. They thought, man, this is a pretty amazing place. Do you know who Hades is in Greek mythology? God of the underworld. And so they saw this and they're like, this is the gates of Hades. This this is like you're plumbing the depths of the spring. You can't even get to the bottom. People tried to swim down. They could never make it, couldn't hold their breath long enough. Then they they took ropes and they put like heavy things on the, the, like tied it with a brick or stone and tried to lower it down in there. How far? And they could never get to the bottom of these springs. They were so deep. This, This is... This is where Hades dwells. And and so what they would do then is this became not only the place where you worship Pan, this became the place where criminals, when they were sentenced to death, got thrown into this and their their bodies. And of course, as I mentioned, they would be filled up with blood from all the goats that were thrown in there too. And, and, And they were trying to appease the God of Hades and the water just kept gushing and flowing. This is the deception of Satan at its finest. This is from the pit of hell. These, these descriptions of these gods and the people who would come and they would offer blood, sacrifice. That's demonic, folks. This is right from Satan. And Jesus is saying with the disciples right there, as they're seeing bloody water coming, flowing right past them, he's going, not even the gates of Hades is gonna prevail against the church. Nothing that represents darkness or idolatry or the falsehood of this world will ever be able to prevail against the church. It might look like it is. It might look like this is the dominant religion, what everyone else is believing, all the deception that they're into, but make no mistake. Here on this Las Vegas strip of all these idols and all these temples, The gates of Hades won't prevail against my church. Nothing is going to stop him 
from building his church. I want to make a couple of observations, applications for us out of this that I hope resonate with you as I've been chewing on this. What does this even mean for us as we reawaken to the church of Christ, this bold statement that he has made? Because here we sit, like I said, 2,000 years later, and while history isn't perfect of the church, there's a lot of blemishes in the church. He's moving. He's moving with power. People are being saved. People are being redeemed. People's lives are being changed. Entire family trees are being changed by Christ. What does this mean for us? First one is this. Don't give up on the church. You've seen the scandals. You've seen the corruption. You've seen the abuse. You've seen false teaching. Maybe you've been hurt specifically, personally by the church. Don't give up on the church. These last couple of years have been very difficult for the church, particularly in the United States of America because of our country and all that's going on. And Christians have lined up for this opinion or for this opinion through politics, through COVID. It's even harder now to persevere with the church through COVID. It's been, these have been some difficult years. The church is messy. The church has warts and blemishes. But Jesus declared that he's the groom who's coming back for this church and he's preparing us as his beautiful bride. That we would be without spot and without blemish. He's not giving up on the church. The church is precious to him. It's his bride. How can we give up on the church? I want to say to you today, if you're struggling in any way, look to Jesus, the groom who's preparing this church. Look to Jesus who treasures his bride and lean into the church. Love well, serve well, worship Jesus well and stay in community with other believers because in heaven, that's who's gonna be there. Us and Jesus, not buildings, not all the other stuff. Stay with the people, stay connected, lean into the church because this is God's plan A and there is no plan B. Don't give up on the church. A second observation is this. Expand your view of the church. I love Emmanuel Church. We have a great church. I love the people that God has brought here. He's done great things here. He's doing great things here. And I have a lot of hope of what God wants to do in this local expression of the church. But I don't pretend to think that this is all of what God is doing in the world. It's not even all of what he's doing in Mechanicsburg. In fact, just this Thursday morning, I was at a meeting with several pastors from, from the area and we were uh, having discussions about how do, we, how do we work together? How do we unite together? And, and I'm not talking about uniting with people who aren't preaching the gospel, people who are not holding to the authority of scripture because Jesus makes dividing lines with those, those people. I'm talking about ones that are like-hearted, that are on the same mission together, who hold Jesus central. There are 75,000 people, at least, this is probably 10 years old of a census, in the Mechanicsburg mailing address. Uh, when you have 17055 and 17050. This is just, just, just mechanics work for the moment here. 75,000 people. Our church is situated right smack in the middle of this. Is there any way that we could reach all the 75,000 people that need to be reached? Is there any way we could feasibly do that? <laughs> no. There's no way. In fact, on any given week, at least two-thirds to three-fourths of the people all around us aren't going to church and aren't connected to Jesus in, in any significant saving relationship. How are we going to reach fifty to 60,000 people? We've got to work together. We've got to have an expanded view that there are other places that Jesus is expressing his church, where people are worshiping him, where people are looking to his word, where people are following his command, empowered by the same Holy Spirit. There's one God, one salvation, one Lord, 
one spirit, one baptism, one faith. If you, if you expand this now to uh, our region, the Harrisburg region from Carlisle to Hershey, there's at least half a million people. Again, that census is old. It's probably 600,000 by now. That would mean there's 350 to 400,000, 450,000 people who are not walking with Christ in this, this greater Harrisburg area. How are we going to reach them? <laughs> Expanding our view of the church. One of the phrases I got um, it's just one of the things that stuck in my head from Thursday morning's discussions. Uh, it's, it, and by the way, that's a group called Christ Together. It's a, it's, a, it's a movement trying to help churches have conversations about how to work together better. And this is a first conversation uh, in, by that group with us here. God's already been doing some cool partnership stuff in the area. Uh, and I love that. But one of the things that was said was, you are not the pastor of a church. You are a pastor of the church. You get the difference? You're not the pastor of a church, like like this church, and you kind of have this myopic, small-minded view of your church. You're just a pastor of the church. Now, translate that to you, to whatever role you have in the church, whether even if you just want to even make it, hey, we're members of a church. I'm I'm not the member of a church. I am a member of the church. Right, We do have this view of our local church, but we gotta have this view of, of God's bigger work he's doing among his people. And instead of competing, we need to collaborate and work together. One of the great expressions of that that's happening right now is that in our English classes ministry here, we have 60 or more people who serve in that ministry. Half, maybe, a little bit more than that, are from Emmanuel Church. That's awesome. I love that that's happening but I also love that half of them are not from Emmanuel Church and we're working together in the kingdom of God to see that foreigners, immigrants in this area, refugees would be reached with the love of Jesus Christ. That's how it's happening. We got to look at how can we work together, not just our church, not just Christian Missionary Alliance. We need to celebrate what God's doing in those places. Lastly, I'd wanna say to you this, don't underestimate the church. For as, as, uh, as often as it is tempting for us to go, well, man, we're not even making a dent or like, what can we really do? God has given us power to see transformation in people's lives. Jesus already opened the doors for that. We just preached last week how the Holy Spirit is the one who comes and he, he's working powerfully in us with the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That kind of power is available to us. And Jesus says to Peter in verse 16, And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whoa, 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 wait a second. (laughs) What? I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You're gonna have a kind of authority that you didn't know was possible for human beings. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What, What does that mean? There are books written about this. I'd love to preach a whole sermon on this and I probably will someday, so look out. (laughs) But what I want to say right now is this is not just given to Peter. This is given, this was in this moment, I, I would see it expanded to all the apostles and then I'd see it expanded to all of us who walk in the name of Jesus, with Jesus. We've been given keys to the kingdom, authority to do things. Like what you see the apostles going on and doing, uh, Peter preached in, at Pentecost in the name of Jesus and 5,000 people became believers that day. The kingdom of God was rocking that day. Jesus did it through Peter. But then it wasn't just limited to Peter. All the apostles went and they were, they were healing people. Uh, the apostle Paul was seeing, like, you know, they were seeing demons cast out of people. They were seeing the kingdom of God advance into new places and, and doing amazing things. And, and, and lives were being transformed because they were given a kind of authority. And this is what Jesus said in the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. And he commissioned us in his authority and in his name. So you may not realize it, but you, me, us, all the believers all around the world have been given keys to the kingdom of God if we're willing to step into them in faith, step in to learn how to use them, be equipped. (laughs) And when, when you're put in the middle of a situation, you don't know what to do, you cry out to the Lord like crazy, Lord, help me. I'm willing to do whatever you want. I'm gonna step into this. I will obey what you're saying. 
And we're gonna see stuff that we do on earth shifting things that are in heaven and things that are in heaven (laughs) shifting things that are on earth. What did Jesus pray? Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's being done through us. Let me make that real, real concrete right here. The last couple of months here at Emmanuel, God's moving in some really powerful ways. I, we can't always tell these stories because they're very personal, but I have literally sat with people processing in their life, praying with them, with, with others too. It's not, not, not about me, but who are getting set free from decades long patterns of sin and breaking the, the guilt and the shame that has been upon them for years. And they're finally like, oh. <laughs> this happens regularly, but I'm, I'm just talking about the last couple of weeks, I've seen some powerful examples of that in our church. It's awesome. God doing a healing work and empowering work in people like that. Uh, this one might blow your brains a little bit. There are people who are getting set free from the power and control of demons in our church. In Jesus' name, it's a beautiful thing. The control, the manipulation, the lies. Getting set free from that, the curses of this world. Because we have the keys of the kingdom. We've been able to love people in Jesus' name. This church body, you guys have done so well loving Fred and Cheryl Bossler. Fred's on hospice. And people have called and they have sent cards and they visited and they brought food. and, And they just say over and over again, we can't believe the love of our church. That's a key to the kingdom. You're, you're loving in Jesus' name and, and you're the hands and feet of Jesus. We just had a sportsman's banquet the last two nights and seven people stepped out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light because we were willing and we said, yes, Lord, we, we will serve and we will, we, will give, we will give people an opportunity to hear about Jesus and, and the good news of the gospel and by faith they believe. We didn't make them do that. Jesus did that, but he used us. It's a key to the kingdom. Don't underestimate what else can be done in your life and through you to other people. There is transformational power given in the authority of the name of Jesus. So don't give up on the church. Don't have too narrow a view of the church, expand it. And don't underestimate what Jesus is gonna do. And it's only gonna accelerate up until the time that he comes back. He's gonna do more and more and more things all of Jesus for all of the world. Let's pray. Lord, this is a moment of reckoning in our hearts as we've heard your word. There may be people here today struggling in one of these ways, feeling like they wanna step back step into safety, get away from the church, or they've been hurt. But I pray today, Lord, you will call us to lean in, to step in. Spirit, you can do that. Jesus, you've called us. You call again today. Let us hear your voice again today. There may be people who have felt possessive of the church or who have seen it too narrowly and have struggled with the, this idea of competing versus collaborating. Lord, I, I pray that you will help us to focus, put the main things as the main things and unite around those things as best as we can <laughs> so that you would build your kingdom here in Mechanicsburg and in Dillsburg and in Camp Hill and in Carlisle and in Boiling Springs and New Cumberland and Harrisburg and Hummelstown and Perry County and all the small towns up there. (laughs) All of us working together to see that your kingdom might be established on earth as it is in heaven. I pray for those who are hearing this going, I I need some of that transformational power. I pray you'll give them the, the courage to ask you again. The courage to share with someone I need, I need someone to work this through with me. I need help. And that the power of God might sweep through more people, transforming them. Because Lord, if, we're not, if we see transformation by the Holy Spirit, then the world has good news to hear from us. Lord, we don't want work that was done 20 years ago to be the only work we're resting on. We want fresh work by your Spirit in us. And may you give us faith to keep 
keep serving, to keep trusting, to keep walking in the authority of your name until you come back for us because we're your church and we're the bride that you're preparing to come back for one day. All for you, all for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, come out tonight at seven o'clock. I'm gonna put this little word in here. Ben Powell's preaching. Ben has never preached in this church, never had this opportunity. He's put together an awesome message. I want you to come tonight to hear him. Um, Have an awesome week. Thank you for coming. Go in peace, church.